wow, look at all your shiny faces. That was amazing. I'm so glad to see you out at the park today. We are going to have a great time. Um, I want to tell you uh, a couple of like housekeeping things as we get started. Uh, one is that our offering box is just sitting on the front of the stage. Uh, so you can drop offering in there uh, anytime, uh, mail or labor. Uh, and also the communion we will do, uh, we're going to sit it out on tables and you'll just come up during the music, take it, and then throw your things away in the trash receptacles which are provided. Uh, so we'll do that later at the end of the service though. All right, I have one announcement today, and that is that Vacation Bible School is July 17th through the 21st. It is 6 to 8 p.m., uh, Monday through Friday of that week. So if you're here and you're visiting or if you're from our Good Shepherd family, uh, keep those dates in mind, July 17th of VBS. So I uh, plan on bringing your kids to that and we are really looking forward to seeing them at that time. There's one other thing where the kids are going to come up and sing a song for you guys. And at, uh, during that time, I'm going to ask that a parent or two help the kids come and line up on this ramp over here, and I will announce when that time is, okay? So just a heads up, it's about three songs in, and then we'll uh, have the kids come and share their song. Right now, we're going to turn it over to Don Roberts uh, and his presentation to Food Finders. You guys just come right up here. Good morning. It's great to be here in the beautiful, sunshiny, warm uh, Sunday morning to be worshiping outside and enjoying uh, God's beautiful creation. For many years, Brady Lane Church has uh, had a food pantry and helped to provide food for those that are in need. Uh, during that time, Bob Betty has led this ministry with uh, many faithful uh, volunteers who have worked hard to keep this project going, and uh, they work closely with Food Finders, and today we're honored to present a check to Food Finders to help them continue their work. And we also want to let you know that, that the need at Food Finders continues, and there's always opportunities to volunteer and to serve. And uh, we'll have an opportunity for you to do some sign up at uh, church next Sunday. And so we're uh, proud to share with Food Finders and continue to encourage their ministry and be a part of it. Thank you, John. Uh, I just want to say that we don't have screens today to look at lyrics, so those went out at 8 a.m. If you normally get a bulletin on your phone through your email, you can open that email and read all the lyrics to the songs. If you're sitting next to someone who doesn't get that, uh, maybe try emailing it to them. I'm not sure. Uh, if not, we just ask you to uh, clap along. I'm sure you will pick up the words as we go. Uh, and for all of those who are just in the park today, we invite you to come and join us because this is a service that is open to everyone. So, um, if you can find words, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to have you stand up and clap along if you can. So, we're going to get started today with a beautiful hymn, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs>
and some of you have some future careers as volleyball players. You guys can have a seat. Uh, any of you would, just let the balls roll to the front. They're, they're good. They can roll up here. Um, all right. I'm going to turn this over to Rob for our prayer time. And meanwhile, parents, can you have your kids come over and join me on this ramp over here? Good morning, Bray Lane. Good morning. We're so excited you could join us today. And for our guests, we're uh, especially excited to have you here. Whether you're here uh, physically into the pavilion or if you're listening to us from a distance, we are glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. This is something that we have been praying for, uh, looking forward to as an opportunity to go into the community and share the gospel message with you. Uh, in our church service this time is when we have the uh, prayer concerns. Uh, and I just have a couple to share with you that uh, Brenda Creason, this is uh, Ginger's niece, will have a bilateral mastectomy on June the 1st, so she's asked for prayers for her niece. And Doris Solomon wants to thank everybody for the phone calls, the prayers, and the visits. That meant uh, a lot to her. And, and so now, uh, we'd like to take a moment here to offer a word of prayer. I'm going to have a, uh, just a moment of silence at the beginning. If there's something on your heart, on your mind, maybe somebody that you want to pray for, uh, we can do it at that time, and then I will go ahead and just close this prayer. So if you would, uh, would you please bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for such a beautiful day that we can just come out into the community and to, uh, to praise your name and to share the gospel message. And Father, for those that are here or those that are listening, Father, may they be touched by the message. And as we lift up uh, Glenda and, and Doris, Father, and the other prayer concerns that uh, are on people's minds and their heart, we just ask that you, uh, your presence would draw near to them to encourage them to know that they are loved and they're cared for. Father, for those that, that need the healing, we ask that you would lay your healing hand upon them. And again, Father, we just thank you for giving us this beautiful day that we can proclaim your name and to worship you. Father, we just thank you for so many blessings that you give us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, guys, so the kids have learned uh, a new song for you guys. How many of you know all of the fruits of the Spirit? I'll give you a hint. There's nine of them. Okay, kids, are you ready to sing it to your parents? Yes. Okay. Can we sing it loud? Yes. All right. Who knows the song the best? Me. All right. Here we go. We're going to sing it all together. You ready? Oh, the fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. The fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit. Because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you. 
You guys can be seated. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out here today. Exciting time. Exciting day. This is a day that I have been praying for for so long. Ever since we started talking about having this day out here in the park, I have been excited and been praying for God to lay the groundwork for this day to happen. So I just I thank God today. Amen. I thank God. And look at this beautiful letter we got. It's all him, and I want to give him the glory today. But it's so fun to get the entire body together. We can't really do this on a Sunday morning because of our space limitations and things that we have, but it's awesome to see our two church families coming together, our two church bodies becoming one today. And it's uh, awesome to have that happen today as well. We also have several of our Good Shepherd families with us this morning, and we want to welcome you here today. We're glad that you joined us on this beautiful Sunday morning to be a part of what we're doing today. It was great to see all the kids up here. That was a mixture of our Good Shepherd kids and our Brady Lane kids that come every Sunday morning. And, and so you got an idea to see how they even work together today uh, to praise God and honor Him. And that was exciting to watch as well. And folks, uh, if your kids come to our, our Good Shepherd Preschool, we want to tell you that we love you guys. We are so happy that you're a part of our weekday family, but we want to invite you to come be part of our Sunday morning family too. So if you have an opportunity or don't have a church family, we would love to invite you to come and join us on a Sunday morning at uh, Brady Wing Church and enjoy a time of worship to see what we have for you and what we have for your students as well. Uh, it was awesome to continue to explore our relationship with Food Finders Food Bank as well today. Uh, we were able to give them a nice check to help with the right now, but we also, as Don said, we want to think about the future and sending some folks to help, and that sign-up will start next week, and we want to rejoice in another opportunity to help feed hungry people. I also want to say good morning today to those of you who might be in range of my voice through the power of amplified sound. Uh, we just want to let you know that we love you all too, and we hope that you are enjoying a beautiful day in the park, and we hope that in some way God blesses you today through what we're doing here together, and we hope that the, uh, the Lord of creation will bless you today. I'm going to be in John chapter 3 this morning. If you want to turn your Bibles, tablets, or phones, if you brought those with you, please open whatever form you have God's Word in today. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 21 of John 3 this morning. If you have a smartphone with you, you don't have a Bible app on your smartphone, you can also just look up in the search engine, uh, BibleGateway.com, or one of those things, and turn to John 3, starting in verse 16 this morning. John 3, 16 is probably the most famous and most quoted verse in all of Scripture. Those of you who know the verse, I want you to say it with me. Even if you're out there in the park today and you know John 3, 16, just go ahead and say it with us this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Many of you probably memorized that verse, probably from a young age. If you grew up in the church uh, and went to vacation Bible school or church camp somewhere, it's probably a verse you had to memorize. Uh, almost everyone has probably seen John 3.16 signs at NFL and college football games in the crowds, Major League Baseball games, you'll see somebody with a sign, John 316. Uh, famous quarterback uh, Tim Tebow would wear John 316 in his eye black on game day to honor his faith in the Lord. Now, we're going to look at this famous verse in detail and also examine the context around it. Um, this is a small part of the chapter that describes the encounter that Jesus had with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders in the law of God, and Nicodemus was trying to understand who Jesus was and why he had come, and Jesus gives him an answer, although it might not have been the answer Nicodemus fully expected. He tells Nicodemus at the end of his lesson in verses 14 and 15 that he would be lifted up, like Moses lifted the golden snake in the book of Numbers to allow those who believe in God to look upon the snake and be healed from the venomous snake bites. In the same way, Jesus was going to be lifted up, and those who would look upon him and believe would be saved from their sin and eternal punishment. After Jesus gives Nicodemus the good news of the gospel, 
John goes on further to clarify Jesus' message given to this Jewish holy man. You see, Jesus knew that God had a plan for him from the very beginning of time. This is just another place in the Gospels that help us to see that Jesus even knew how he would be killed. When he uses that term, lifted up, when he tells Nicodemus what's going to happen to him, this was a common way to say one was going to be crucified back in that time. It would have been like the words we would use to describe capital punishment today. For instance, back in the day, people would say at a public hanging, they're about to get their neck stretched. Or someone electrocuted in an electric chair. They would ride the lightning. It's just another way, when we say being lifted up, was another way back in that time to describe Jesus being crucified on a cross. John goes on to pin the rest of the text, further explaining Jesus' statements to Nicodemus. Let's look at our famous text today, starting in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now we're going to stop right there, but keep your Bibles marked or open or however you want to do that, because we're going to come back to the text in a minute. But who gets eternal life in that text? I'm asking. Whoever believes. Whoever believes, which means everyone who believes in the name of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of the living God. If you're in my earshot today and you've heard that message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you believe in that today, you too can have eternal life with him. To start out, we're going to break down 316 into seven separate ideas. And maybe you like to write in your Bible, mark your Bible up like I do. Mine's all marked up. But as we go through this one verse, I'm going to break it down into small chunks. And I want you to just mark, if you want to, in your Bibles, the breaks in the sentence as we study it. Because it will help you, I think, in the future as you look at this verse. First of all, we're going to start with the first two words. For God. It starts with the Creator. God is where the plan starts. God is where this plan will end. God orchestrates not only the life of Jesus, but he had a plan for every person that would lead up to Jesus, and he has a plan for everyone who comes after him, including all of us. He has a plan for you today. I want to encourage you with that this morning. He set the entire world into motion from the beginning. God is the source of the plan to save humanity from our sin as well. That plan comes from God. Now the second idea comes in the second pair of words. So love. This salvation that God is sending comes from love, not condemnation. I want you to hear that clearly this morning. Jesus comes in love, not in condemnation. The salvation that God is providing, the plan that he is setting into motion, is not based on condemning the world, although condemnation is waiting for those that don't believe. The plan is based in love. God doesn't want anyone to die separated from him. Amen? Amen. He loves all he has created, but the requirement of us is that we believe and love him back. God's eternal gift is free, but it comes with a price that he paid. He paid a price because he loved us so much, not because he had a desire to condemn the world. The third idea is the world, the object of his love, the object of his creation, the object of his work, of his craft that he put together himself. The world is what God loves. Here we focus on the one and the who and the what that he loves, everything that he has made. We are the object of his love. Did you know that the God of the universe loves you this morning? Amen. The God that created this beautiful day loves you this morning. The God that put everything into motion cares about you and knows what you're going through and knows your heart and knows what you need. And he is there for you, waiting for you to come to him. 
Maybe today you're finding yourself feeling lonely. Maybe you are anxious or afraid today. Maybe today you don't feel that you can ever be good enough, that you're not worthy of God's love. Maybe today someone else has made you feel that way. Maybe even someone who considers themselves a Christian. You know, even the members of the church can be just as hurtful with our judgment sometimes as those outside the church. Maybe today you're wrestling with something you can't get out of your life. You haven't been able to, to overcome this thing. You've been wrestling with it. Can I give you all some encouragement this morning? Take heart, my friends, because there is a God who loves you so much that he sacrificed everything because he loves you. He is ready to save you. He's ready to give you peace. He's ready to give you hope. He's ready to give you love. The next idea from 316 is that he gave. God was the one who moved toward us. And he is still moving toward us today. We need to understand that God was the one who made the first move. Sometimes I think folks think that there's this big step that they have to take to be saved in Christ. But that there's this huge chasm between them and God. And they have to take this gigantic leap to find Jesus. But there are a ton of hoops that you have to jump through to be saved in him. Truth is, the leap for us is really just a few small steps. God did all the heavy lifting here. Amen? Amen. God moved from eternity to earth for us. He gave means he left his place in eternal heaven, a place of eternal peace, a place of eternal comfort, a piece of eternal love and light to come into this place of war and famine and pestilence and hate and darkness. Jesus made the gigantic leap. And then he took on the cross. He took that on for us. And all he asks for in return is for us to believe in him and start walking with him. Folks, he came a long way for us. And he just wants us to come the rest of the way. Now I want to illustrate this a little bit. And then you might find it a weird illustration, but that's okay. I'm a weird dude. So, um, How many of you have seen that movie Hitch with Will Smith and Kevin James? How many of you have seen the movie Hitch? Okay. Stay with me. I know this is a weird illustration, but stay with me. In the movie Hitch, there's this scene where Will Smith is trying to teach Kevin James' character how to do the first kiss with this girl that he really likes. And I don't know if you've seen that movie or not. Will Smith is this relationship guru, and he, he helps guys get out of their own way and, and stop being stupid so that they can, without any hesitation, tell a woman that they are interested in them and want to see them. I know that's ironic with today, knowing what we know about Will. But, um... He talks him through this phase of, you don't want to be the shy guy. You don't want to be the guy that, that, that holds back, because girls don't like that. And you also don't want to come in too hot. And there's this scene where Kevin comes in too hot. And he lays this big old kiss right on Will Smith's lips. And Will smacks him across the face like, what are you doing? Again, ironic. Um, and... I know this is a weird illustration, but what Will was trying to get Kevin to understand was you want to lean in almost all the way, but you want to stop short. And you want to allow the lady to make the decision if she wants to kiss you back or not. It needs to be a mutual thing. And I know it's weird, but stay with me. This is how God kind of his way that he showed us love on a much larger and, and a, of course, a much deeper spiritual scale. God came most of the way, you see. He came most of the way to us, and all he wants us to do is come the rest of the way. He stopped just short of, of that and said, now I want you to come the rest of the way to show me that you believe in me and you love me back. God created us to love him back in a real relationship. God wants a true relationship, a real love. God doesn't want some fake, go-through-the-motions religion. Okay? Religion is not what we are doing here today. Religion is not why we came out to the middle of the park today. 
Religion is not what we do at 2701 Brady Lane every Sunday. We have a relationship with our Savior. And He has a relationship with us. Now on a related note, so many folks that I have talked to are afraid of walking down the aisle, taking those few steps to accept Christ, or even just making that commitment. A committed relationship with their Savior that they, they struggle with. That they feel like it's this giant leap that they have to make. And I want to tell you right now, it's just a small step that God is asking for. God came most of the way. He ripped himself out of eternity and sacrificed himself to save us. He just wants us to say back to him, I believe in you. I surrender all. I will live for you. That's all he wants. Now what did he sacrifice? That's our next idea. His one and only son. His one and only son. His son was 100% man, 100% God, and 100% sacrificed. Fully God, fully human. We looked at all of this throughout Jesus' time on earth. As a man, he was unpopular with those in power, right? They wanted him out of the way. They didn't like what he was doing. Yet as God, he had the power to drive out demons. As a man, he was worn out and slept on a boat so soundly that the storm that was going on didn't wake him up. Yet as God, when the disciples did wake him up for fear that they were going to drown, he stood up and with only his voice, he calmed the storm. As a man, he wept at the tomb of a friend who had just died, yet as God, he had the power to bring that man back to life. This is the part of the story that we celebrate each year at the memorial of the resurrection of Jesus. God sent his son. He sent the only thing that he could truly identify with, a father-son relationship, and he helped us to see that. A human being who is also God, God in the flesh, he sent him to make a full and complete sacrifice of self to demonstrate how much he loves us. And while we are still sinners, Christ dies for us. Famous text from Paul to the Romans. Jesus had to be a man so that he could identify with us, suffering in our place and sympathizing with us in our weaknesses. But Jesus had to be fully God so that he could satisfy God's wrath and secure for us true righteousness and eternal life. 100% God, 100% human, 100% sacrificed for us. And who was that sacrificed for? We find that in the next idea. Whoever believes, anyone, no matter what race, no matter what gender, no matter what creed, no matter what skill set, no matter what family line, no matter what economic level, 100% saved through faith in Christ. Anyone can have that. Rich or poor. We see members of the Sanhedrin like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea coming to believe in Jesus, two wealthy religious aristocrats. Just as much as we see ordinary men like Peter and John, fishermen, modern day minimum wage workers. We see men and women, Mary Magdalene, Martha and Mary, sisters of Lazarus. Throughout scripture we see an Ethiopian and a Roman and a Greek and a Samaritan and a Cyrene and a Jew. And many of each coming to know and believe in Jesus. He wasn't just for one people. He wasn't just for one race. He wasn't just for one nation. His sacrifice was for all people. Whoever believes in him. Now the King James Version of this text, the word whoever is exchanged with the word whosoever. So those of you that have KJV today, you probably saw that whosoever in there rather than whoever. We need to rejoice that Jesus was for all, but in the same breath, we need to remember that Jesus is still for all. We are not to withhold the gospel from anyone, even if they don't look or act like us. We don't want to wait for people to get their lives together before we introduce them to Jesus. Because why? Because we don't have our lives together. Amen? We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We all have work to do. Come and join us in this endeavor. That's what he's doing for you and for me. And he wants to do it for others as well. But thanks be to God. He gave us his son so that all of us can be forgiven. 
If you are wondering today if you are a whosoever, I want to tell you that you are. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, that is what is required for you to become a whosoever. Once you believe then, the first thing you do as a believer is you are immersed, baptized into Christ. Which is the last idea that comes from this text, eternal life. To enter into eternal life, you must be born again. Eternal life is discussed in what we have already read quite a bit, but Jesus spells it out for Nicodemus earlier in the text. If you want to go back to chapter 3, verse 3, Nicodemus explains this to, or Jesus explains this to Nicodemus. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again if they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Now to understand this concept of being born again in the water and the Spirit, we interpret that to mean that Jesus was speaking of baptism as the mode in which the Spirit begins the work of transformation into a new creation. Through water baptism, this happens. But make it clear that it is the Holy Spirit of God that is doing the work. Amen. Not us. Not people, not the person being baptized, and not the person doing the baptism. The work is being done by the Holy Spirit of God. Our baptism is an outward, visible sign of what's spiritually happening on the inside of us. Our baptism is a testimony to others about the Holy Spirit doing His work on us. Jesus' blood justifies us. Justification means taking our place on the cross, taking the punishment for our judgment. Dying so that we do not have to die the second death because of our sin. But now the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And sanctification is the process of being made holy and set apart before God. And it's in our baptism that we are set apart by the Holy Spirit as one sanctified, made holy before God. If you're wrestling with believing in Jesus this morning, or maybe you're coming to believe in Him, but you're not sure about following Him, let me share with you the rest of our text for this morning. Maybe you find yourself on the fence today. Let me show you the rest of our text, starting in verse 19 in chapter 3. This, ver this is the verdict, John says. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Now this last part of the text is less than simple. It's essentially saying that the affections of people in the world are corrupt. Their desires are fallen. They are eager to stay away from God. They love darkness instead of light. In fact, it says they hate the light. This is strong language which uncovers something of the seriousness of the moral struggle between God and the world. You see, evil and darkness do not ignore the light. They wage war against it. They wage war against it, trying to bring it down. But despite these efforts, the darkness cannot be over, or the darkness cannot overcome the light. The darkness launches a battle that brings about its own defeat. By contrast, those who love the coming of the light, who look upon and who believe in Jesus, live by the truth. These people not only enjoy eternal life, but they come into the light and yearn for its truth. And that's us today. John does not have in mind here people in the world who already have the goodness of God at work in their hearts and whom the light reveals. John is describing what happens when those who make a choice to believe, they are transformed into children of God, experiencing the power of the Spirit and the living truth. Believers then live righteously because God is at work in them, not because they have the ability to be godly on their own, but through the transformative work of the Holy Spirit given us by God as a gift. Here's our main point this morning, and it comes in the form of a question. Do you want to live in the light, or do you love the darkness too much to leave it? Only those who love and enter into the light of Jesus will see eternal life. Let's pray. 
Father God, we come before you today and we celebrate you in the beauty of this place. What a wonderful day you have created for us. What a beautiful place you have made for us to worship you today. Father, we thank you for all who have come out today to worship with us. We thank you for the people who are out in the park today. We ask that you bless them today. Father, we just pray that you have been glorified, that you have been made famous with the reading of your word and with the songs that we sang to you in love and the prayers that we raise before you now. Father, we want to please you today. This is a day that you have made, and in it we rejoice and we are glad. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and you want to do that today, just because we're not at the church doesn't mean we're not going to have an invitation. I want to invite you to come and know Jesus today. The band's going to play a song here in a minute, and I'm going to come down here on the floor level here. I'm going to invite some other folks, any of our elders who are present. Um, um, uh, Jeff, Jeff's over here. Um, any of our prayer team folks who want to come up. We're just going to spread out around the ring of the, of, the, of the seating here. And if you want somebody to pray with you today, maybe you just need somebody to pray with you before we leave today. Uh, maybe you want to give your life to Christ. Uh, maybe you want to join our church family. You've never done that and want to become part of who we are. I invite you to come as we sing this song of invitation this morning. Would you stand?
time for communion. So we're going to sing a communion hymn, and then Don is going to come up and give our communion meditation. passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In these verses, Paul gives instructions to the Corinthian church to remember the purpose of the bread and the cup. They are to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross to pay the price for their sins and for ours. The bread being a reminder of Jesus' body which was beaten and then nailed to the cross. The cup is a reminder that the blood that he shed was to pay the price for our sins. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the sacrifice was also required to be perfect and without blemish. Jesus is the only one who has ever been the, that perfect one to qualify to be that sacrifice. Jesus, the only Son of God, came willingly to earth to be our example and our sacrifice. I believe that these were common elements that were found probably at almost every meal at this time and were, and were to be a constant reminder to each Christian when they sat down to eat to stop and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for them. And this also applies to us today. When you sit down to eat, it is also a great time for prayer and remembering that you are blessed because God loved you enough to send his son to be that sacrifice for your sins and then to prepare a place for you in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you giving thanks because you've loved us enough to show that love by sending your son to be that perfect example and that perfect sacrifice who was willing to shed his blood to pay the price for our sins. Father, as we come before you now to partake of these emblems, reminding me of the body and the blood of Jesus that was broken and shed for us, we pray, Father, that we will renew in our hearts that relationship with you and establish and honor the gift that has been given for our behalf, on our behalf. Fill us anew with your spirit, Lord. Guide us that we might walk close to you and be filled with your spirit on your each day. Bless this time together, Father. Bless the fellowship that follows. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.